In this video, let's talk about how to select a squat variation and prep strategy for a narrow ISA with sway back posture. This was one of the topics that I had on a recent mentorship call. And it was really interesting because I think in order to make these decisions, we need to understand what we mean by narrow ISA, what we mean by sway back posture, how that can sometimes be different depending on the individual, and then what we can manipulate in terms of the exercise selection, in terms of the load selection, and in terms of the cue selection. And when we get all of these just right, having that clear understanding of who that person is, then we can get a better result, both from a mobility standpoint, as well as a progressive strengthening standpoint. So we're gonna start here by defining the narrow ISA, looking at the two different types of sway back posture. And then we're gonna go through some decision-making frameworks for what squat we wanna select, as well as what cues we might select and how load selection might play into this. So starting with the narrow ISA. When we look at the ISA, that's just this angle here. We have people that are structurally biased towards more of the wide. We have people that are structurally biased towards more of the narrow, and then obviously in between. When we're talking about sway back posture, we're usually talking about someone that has a narrow ISA. In a sway back posture, we have the hips pushing forward, and then we have the rib cage swaying back in opposition. And so in most cases, these folks are kind of hanging out at the end range of hip extension and then counteracting that through the rib cage. This is important because the backness of the rib cage can manifest as a few different positions. If we look at the rib cage as a whole, usually in a sway back posture, because the rib cage is back, we're gonna see that the shape of the rib cage looks a little bit more compressed in the front and a little bit more expanded in the back. However, the orientation, so the position of this rib cage in space can either be like this, where we're shifting back here with the sternum down, or we take this existing shape, sternum down, relatively more expanded in the back, and then right here at the lower rib cage, we just sort of incline everything back. So we're actually extending at the lower rib cage with that same shape just being changed in space from here to here versus being pretty much upright to start and then getting this shape that comes down like this. As you can see, in both cases, we have rounding in the back and we have a sternum that's down, but the difference is this as a orientation of the rib cage versus this. Now we need to ask about what do the squat variations do to the ISA and how does this orientation play into it? So just looking from a shape perspective, wide versus narrow, right? Sternum down versus sternum up. We wanna look at all these different squat variations. On one end of the spectrum, we're gonna have variations where we hold a weight out in front of the body. And the further out in front of us that we hold the weight, the more we're gonna tend to shift back and potentially as a consequence, come down here in the front. On the flip side, the further back we put the weight, Usually, the more we are going to be pushed forward at the front and, and have the sternum come up, but also the more we're gonna compress the back. And of course, there are intermediate variations where we're gonna have the bar somewhere in between, which is gonna be a healthy mix of both. And right now, we're just talking about the position that each exercise ends up naturally creating because of the position of the bar. So let's go in order. The most down in the front, expanded in the back kind of a variation, goblet squat. Then next to that, probably zercher squat, where we're holding the weight down low. Then front squat, where we're holding the bar here on the upper chest. And then we're getting into safety squat bar, where we're holding the arms out in front, but the bar is on the back. Then we get into high bar back squat, and finally low bar back squat. We have low bar back squat on one end of the spectrum and we have goblet squat on the other end of the spectrum. If the percentage of load is equated in these different lifts, we can expect to have this predictable influence on the shape of the rib cage. Now, for someone who is a narrow ISA, they already look like this, right? That's what their shape already is. 
And so if we have a sway back, type one or type two, doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, the shape we wanna create within the rib cage is going from this to going to this. That's just what it is. But if we have this shape that's tipped back, we could do a lot of extension biased lifting and just even more so extend here without changing the shape of that rib cage at all. And that's the risk we can run into. So let's go through this. If that person is here, type one, we can expect that if we put a bar on their back and we overall increase extension, we're probably gonna make a favorable change in the shape of their rib cage. However, if that person is like this to start, in this case, what might be a better option is if we put a bar right here as in a front squat and then cue them to come up into that bar with the upper ribs while also taking advantage of the fact that the weight is out in front and they're just gonna shift back, now we can get relative flexion here. So instead of being extended, we can shift back to get the flexion, but because we have a bar here and we're gonna cue breathing up into it, we can get the upper ribs to go up, but we get the lower ribs to expand back. The more weight we add in that front squat, the more they're gonna to have to cue pushing their elbows up, which is going to take this upper thoracic region and extend it even more, which is gonna be favorable for the rib cage shape that we want. However, once the weight gets to a certain point, it's actually going to be harder and harder for us to stay up into that bar, and it could start to compress us down back towards the shape that we don't want. So if we just review here, if we have somebody who is a little bit more like this, they are in a flexed state. Let's choose something that moves them towards extension. High bar back squat, for example. If we have someone who's in this flexed state, but then oriented into extension, we need to do something that helps reduce that orientation first and then cue or constrain them to move those upper ribs relative to the lower ribs. So that's wrapping up the actual squat selection. Now let's get into prep strategies. So in our prep strategies, we might be looking at similar themes. If we take the person who presents a little bit more like this, they are globally flexed. All we gotta do is extend them. So this is where something like a bench thoracic extension with the thoracic spine on the bench and then arms going back overhead, even something like a prone Superman or a reverse hyperextension, anything that gives us global extension throughout that axial skeleton is probably gonna work pretty well. But if we get that person who is already extending here, right, to compensate for this, then what we wanna do once again is we wanna move this back as we move this up. A great way to do this would be to use something like a kneeling thoracic extension where we're gonna naturally, just by having the knees up a little bit, just naturally round here. And then by having the arms on the bench, we're gonna extend through that upper thorax, right? That gives us the reverse engineering of what we had in the first place. So this goes back, this goes up. Another way to do that, let's say if we're laying down like this, another way to do that is to cue the bottom of this rib cage into a bench or support surface, then use a weight in the hand and do something like a dumbbell pullover. Inhaling as we go back to expand that rib cage while constraining the bottom here so that we're not just orienting this as a whole unit. Now, where I find we can actually supercharge this is by using our understanding of anatomy to be able to manipulate the movement of these upper ribs. Remember, the upper ribs are kind of stubborn. They don't move as well as the rest of the ribs. And if we focus in on what the muscles are in that area, we can then figure out what movements will help us use those muscles to manipulate that position. So if we go back to the narrow ISA, they're gonna to tend to have that depressed sternum. So the ribs are moving into internal rotation. So our goal is to get sternum to come up and ribs to move up into elevation and external rotation. How are we gonna do that? What muscles have leverage to do that? Well, it turns out if we look at muscles that attach to the top of the sternum in the upper ribs that can pull us vertically and back, a few things are gonna to come to mind. We get scalenes, we get sternocleidomastoid, often muscles that people are thinking about 
avoiding or not using as much. But this is a mistake because if we get the head above the rib cage over here, so not out in front of the rib cage, above the rib cage, and we get the upper cervical spine neutral, muscles that are biarticulate, like the sternocleidomastoid, are actually going to gain leverage at their attachment here at the sternum and lose leverage at their attachment here at the cranium. So neutral cranium and more leverage here means we're going to have more leverage to pull up. So we could take that pullover, hang the head off the side, little chin tuck, get some of those muscles to assist us in moving these upper ribs up. Another option for this is all of the recent neck training that I've been posting on this channel. If you haven't seen it, I mean, check out the last six videos. I go through some of my favorites here, but I think the unmatched best exercise for this, in my opinion, I'm a little bit biased, is the Chaplin neck lift. This is where we're gonna have the head coming back over the bench. And what we're trying to do, maintaining a neutral upper cervical spine, is to use the sternocleidomastoid at the sternum attachment, as well as the scalenes to pull this upper rib cage up. And because the head's then gonna be down here and back, right? And so as long as we keep this down on the support, support surface, and we use those muscles with the head down here, we're gonna actually drag just the upper ribs up. So going back to this guy, our sway back, right? That's gonna help us to do this and do this at the same time. So in any event, I think probably the best prep strategy for this kind of person is something with arms overhead, something that allows us to extend that thoracic area of the spine, lift the ribs, lift the sternum. You do that, couple of rounds, however you wanna do it, breathing, reps, whatever it is, an accessory first, whatever it is, doesn't matter. And then you go into your squats from there, you're gonna have more access to those positions. Then you're gonna think about what squat am I gonna do? What load am I gonna select? How is that impacting what I'm seeing in front of me? And then obviously you're gonna choose everything else, your rep ranges, your set ranges, your progressions based on being able to maintain more of that favorable position and shape. So there you have it. Using our understanding of the ISA and these two different kinds of sway back to then not only choose a squat, but also to understand how cue selection, load selection, and prep strategies can all come in to make the program that we're writing more tailored for that individual. Now, if you wanna dive a little bit deeper into understanding these concepts and how to apply it in program design for clients or in your own program design, join my Applied Biomechanics Mentorship. As always, thanks for watching these videos. Let me know what questions you might have down below in the comments. I am looking for your input in terms of what you wanna see, uh, because I enjoy making these videos when people actually watch them. So all the things that help the algorithm help me help more people, please like, subscribe, all that. And until next time, peace.